we must be vigilant to prevent this disease which is hard to detect and has no ob obvious cure managing in times of covid-19 is a daunting task without clarity about when the pandemic will pass it is difficult to plan a return to normal meanwhile the stalled economy is causing great hardship and damage to production and consumption our economy was already on shaky grounds before the virus struck it is taking a battering and will require a great deal of management fortitude and government support to res restore business health once this threat recedes the key to economic recovery is rapid containment of the pandemic that allows progressive resumption of business historically pandemics have a graph graph of starting slowly gaining momentum peaking and then petering out wuhan where the corona virus began uh, was locked up for 3 months and it is now returning to a semblance of normality covid-19 is showing signs of peaking and petering out in the most affected parts of europe india has hopefully managed to flatten the curve by locking down early in any case if wuhan is to be taken as an example for peaking and petering of covid-19 then one could budget 2 to 3 months of economic shutdown before resumption of regular business i hope i'm not sound, sounding too dry even after this crisis is behind us the world will not go back to the old normal behavioral changes involving work and social interaction and governance will linger on and some of the changes may become permanent the most obvious has been in the way that we have been working in the last 3 weeks while remote work technologies have been around for three decades most businesses favored physical presence and interaction for work and supervision they have invested in buildings and prioritized everybody traveling to one place instead of reaching out to people wherever they are the virus has helped everyone appreciate remote work technology the bosses should now learn to trust remote workers and all of us to work honestly while we are working remotely thanks to remote work back office and services sector operations have continued during the lockdown education has moved online quickly so much that a physical virtual hybrid will probably be the default mode in the future aima has accelerated its efforts to expand its online education portfolio and the organization has built internal capacity to operate online while many and lmas have already created online capacity the situation is a reminder to the other lmas that digitization and online capabilities are essential this disruption has made a clear business case for automation enterprises will automate a lot of the processes across the value chain and integration into the supply chain will require all the partners to make their businesses disruption resistant by using technology the use of digital platforms internet of things robotics and artificial intelligence is likely to increase as businesses try to minimize disruption due to a health crisis or economic lockdown for whatever reason everybody should be prepared to pay a little more in the post covid period extensive relief programs which have been announced by governments all around the world must be funded governments are paying for food and healthcare for many differing taxes and debt repayments of the private sector lowering interest rates and literally stuffing more money into the financial system a lot of private sector losses during this period will be nationalized to protect sectors and organizations that are central to economies some governments are reducing the stress on their finances through informal taxation in the form of citizens donations to the government most countries are likely to see the impact of covid-19 on their fiscal and monetary policies for many quarters to come global supply chains will certainly see significant changes due to breakdown of global production and logistics just in time and lean management practices have proven vulnerable and businesses are more likely to invest in reserve inventories and suppliers the high dependence on china for manufacturing of electronics auto parts or pharma ingredients could be reduced india stands to benefit 
from a reorganization of global supply chains, provided things do not get any worse from here onwards. It is, most, it is likely that most global companies would prefer to have a certain minimum local supply chain close to their manufacturing sites, wherever they may be. All in all, this COVID crisis has challenged management to rethink, a fundamental rethink of business structures and processes and behavior in the coming years. So with that, I think I shall stop now. And uh, I will, before I request Mr. our past president, Mr. Munjal, to address us, I'd request that all of you, all of you who have to make any question or ask, uh, make any comment or ask any question to please open the chat box below and type in your question or comment over there and post it. These questions will come to me and I should request one of the other speakers to respond to that or I should respond to it myself. Uh, Mr. Munjal, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, let me wish everyone a good evening and welcome to this unique initiative by All India Management Association to get people, information, knowledge, and an interactive platform at your homes. The time right now is being compared with events which have not happened in this generation's life. It's being compared to the world wars. It's being compared to the Great Depression also being compared to the plague. And in many ways, it's almost like nothing that's ever happened before. If you think about it, all the citizens in every town, village and city, in every country across the globe, have been asked to bind themselves to one place. Those who are at home have been asked to stay at home. Those who are doing essential services have been asked to stay close to the place where they will provide the essential service. At the same time, we also have to realize that it's a virus like any other virus. It is a flu like any other flu. And by the way, the number of deaths since the 1st of January till now from this pandemic are actually much less than from the common flu, from diabetes, from heart disease, from road accidents, from smoking, from cancer, a whole host of others. But what makes it dangerous and scary is the pace at which it is spreading. And also because the incubation period of this is 14 days, many of us could possibly be spreading it without even knowing that we have it. So that's what makes this pandemic dangerous. And also because we actually do not have a real vaccine or any medication for this. There are three different, actually more than three, but broadly three different kinds of treatments which are now being tried for this. There are a whole host of them which are under experimentation and trial. Uh, we have 96 trials with 54 different formulations going on around the world at this moment. The Indian government, uh, some say started late, but the reality is the number of cases we had, active cases was lesser than many other countries. It's now acknowledged across the world that the action by the Indian government and the Indian system has been stricter than any other country on the planet. And the only defense that we have against this pandemic is to break the chain. And because we do not have treatment, this is the only way we can break the chain, which is by maintaining the distance that we've been asked to. So I would urge all of you to listen to this advice carefully. Even the advice on washing your hands again and again and in using uh, alcohol-based sanitizer is actually a scientific advice because the outer layer of this uh, virus is actually a layer of fat which dissolves and dies in chemicals which are in soap and also in alcohol-based sanitizers, which is the reason we've been asked to use them repeatedly every day many, many times. Um, so uh, I, I'll stop on, on the virus itself because we all get an overload of information uh, right now on this. What I'd like to talk about is that whenever there is any earth shattering event, any cataclysmic event that takes place in the world, it leads to change. If you think about what happened 
in the previous big events like this, during the World War, it, it spurted innovation. Many manufacturing companies started making guns and tanks and aircrafts, uh, which they had never done before. Uh, Siemens and Volkswagen and, and companies that we know were making regular products for everyday use became defense manufacturers and suppliers. And post the war, innovation really kicked in. And then came the Cold War. So each time something of this nature has happened, it brings in change. Some of it is temporary, as it will be now, because we will spring back to many of our old habits. But some of the change which this will bring will for sure be permanent. So we are beginning to categorize, if you look at the impact on business, in three categories. Some are companies that will gain from this. So healthcare companies, uh, telecommunication companies, video conferences, com there are a whole host of them which are seeing a dramatic surge in their business. If you look, for example, at Zoom call, I presume this is a Zoom call we're on, at, at right now. Zoom call till two months ago had 10 million subscribers. Last week, they had 220 million subscribers. They had never imagined they would get to this size. They were also, by the way, not prepared. So they made some mistakes. They had some uh, security lapses. But that's what happens when you make dramatic change. There are some companies which have been badly affected by the current situation. Uh, hotels, airlines, travel portals, and the like, the travel, tourism, all of the industries, uh, the eateries, restaurants, movie theaters, uh, places which have large gatherings like the opera um, and, and other uh, sources of entertainment, sports gatherings, etc. Just the conferences that we've had canceled in the last uh, one month have cost the world over $2 billion, just those. So the impact of this is going to be twinfold. And I'll, I'll come to a third set of companies, by the way. I've, I've addressed only two of them, one which are gaining and one which will temporarily lo lose. There are some which will lose permanently, where will be a permanent change of our habit or usage or consumption will take place. So we, we have to be aware and conscious of all of these things. As we are in the middle of this, we are locked in at homes. It is sensible and smart that we use this time not just to work from home, but also to ideate, to innovate, to think of research ideas, to think of how we could do things differently, how we could do them better. There are some things for sure. Now it is clear many companies are saying, why do we have these large box offices? Why do we have thousands of tens of thousands of people sitting in the same place? Let me allow dispersed working. Because what this last few weeks has shown me is the system actually works. So in our companies, for example, we have regular meetings taking place. We have review meetings. We also have board meetings taking place, as many, many other companies do. So each team meets with each other every morning, and they're using different platforms. Zoom call is, is a popular one, but there are also other platforms being used. Uh, Microsoft has one. There are, there are a whole bunch of platforms that are available. So that technology has allowed us to cut back on some of our travel. There's a friend of mine who has uh, offices and, and businesses in Europe and in the US. He's saying, I must be mad. I was going every month for a review meeting to those places. I've just told them I'm going to come one in six or eight months now, and I will do all the monthly reviews only on video. I'm not going to come and see you every, every time because I've seen you guys enough. We are familiar with each other. Uh, the concept of, of physically meeting each other is, is an important one. But it's only part of what we need to do. We need now to make this uh, uh, step change in how we conduct business, in how we deliver education, in how training is done. There is a whole host of services. If you just look at the delivery services right now, of course, at this moment, we are all locked in home. So we do need everything right down to our vegetables or med medication at least, and things of the nature to, to come in home. But the reality is, for many people, the convenience this has demonstrated is phenomenal. So that's another business, for sure, which is going to change permanently for the better. So there is, there is need for us to speculate smartly on the changes that are likely to take place. I'm not dwelling too much on, on the disease itself, because we have uh, excessive information coming in, except a request to all of you is to stop 
watching TV all the time only for news on the COVID-19. Set yourself one or two times in the day to get, and there's enough information you will get. And also please stop these crazy messages which go around on WhatsApp and other medium, uh, because the bulk of them people are now saying is actually not correct. They're not true. They spread either panic or unnecessary hope. The reality is that this is a disease that we will beat, but we will only beat it in time once we've got over the hump. In India, it is expected we will get to the peak numbers anytime between the next three to eight weeks. So all the preparation that we have been doing. So uh, Sanjay, what you're saying is not a doomsday uh, situation. It is a reality. If we hit the, the maximum numbers in the next eight weeks, the impact of this will last two years on the economy. If we hit them earlier, the impact is likely to last a year and a half. Please note, it's not two months or four months or six months. The impact for sure will be beyond this year. There is now speculation uh, about India's GDP growth. It's certainly not going to be the eight or seven or the six percent that we had got used to. It's not even going to be the five percent that we had last year. There is now speculation that if this continues for a while longer, we will have an actual contraction as is expected in many of the developed countries. We are aware that countries across Europe, that countries in North America have already declared that there is a definite contraction in their economies and the size of business in this uh, coming financial year. In India too, we need to be prepared for a tough situation because as humanitarians, many of us chose to pay the wages and salaries. The government is also requesting businesses and companies, please don't fire people. But after one month, people have now started to raise a question that I have no revenue. How long can I keep all my costs at the same level? I have to bring some costs down. So there are some tough calls to be made. We already had millions of people right now across the country who are displaced. Many of them are living in shelters. Some are being supported by philanthropists, foundations, individuals, and companies, and being fed some clothes so we do need to make sure that we realize that there is a human, humanitarian crisis that has taken place as well. So it's three parts to this. One is the health and the preparation for the health crisis and addressing the, the COVID-19 situation and learning from this to prepare for other crises in the future. Second is the hum, pure humanitarian crisis of hunger and joblessness. And this, by the way, is going to grow uh, because many companies will shrink at least temporarily some will shrink permanently. Therefore, the number of jobs for a while will certainly shrink. And third, as I was saying earlier, is the sheer economics and the business end of it. So we have to figure out a way to balance these. There is a debate going on across India right now about lives or livelihood. I don't think we have a choice. We have to manage both. Lives are critical because every human life has a value and livelihoods are important because that's the only way we are going to be able to feed our population. In the interim, we do expect uh, that the support at the government of India and the state governments in the administrative machinery has shown amazing leadership. And with support from business, civil society, foundations, overall, India seems to be doing a reasonably good job. We are, of course, woefully short on capacity. If the numbers uh, of infected and the numbers of severely infected become anywhere close to what we have seen in countries like Italy or Spain or uh, the US or some of the other, other countries. Hopefully, uh, we will not be that badly afflicted because we came in early with the lockdowns. And while some people have complained with the prime minister's speech, but the reality is, uh, uh, and I'm talking about the speech about an extent, extension of the lockdown, but the reality is that is the only sensible thing we can do right now keep ourselves safe, keep ourselves segregated, and at the same time, prepare for a phased uh, back, limping back to uh, economic activity, because any part of the economy that we open, we have to open the entire value chain for it to work. So the suppliers, supply chain, manufacturing, or services, uh, or, or the value add services, and also the distribution and sales of that product or service. All of this had to open at the, at the same time, only that, then that industry is going to function. We're also now saying, please operate only at 25% capacity for a while. 
which also means that all of these businesses will actually run at a loss because there is no business that can actually be profitable at 25 percent uh, operate capacity of operation but at least we will get back the economic activity some revenue can start even if it's a trickle we do need to to allow ourselves to limp back and we must only limp back we must not try and leap back because we will open ourselves to a massive risk of a flood of cases striking India as other countries have been. So, uh, like many others, I am quite hopeful that this will spur, our, spur us into uh, the kind of movement we have demonstrated. Uh, yesterday, I was on another call where I mentioned the five R's are what we are expecting from all of us. Um, resilience, reform, reimagination. So there are many things that we have demonstrated already. Uh, India has stood together, shoulder to shoulder, across the country, all sections of society are standing and supporting the initiatives, their <laughs> own, collectively, or start supporting some from behind. I think this has been a tremendous demonstration of national unity and of international communities leaning on each other. Uh, I hope that this situation uh, over the coming months will get better. And by the way, I do think it's many months before it gets fully better. But the economic activities will start off uh, in the coming weeks. And we have to continue to be watchful and supportive of the way the government and the administrative machinery is guiding us. They are doing it very, very sensibly. Uh, there are other things that we can we can uh, talk about, but I, I can bring them up in the later questions and answers uh, because I think we are now uh, running out of time for the second speaker. So thank you all very much and good wishes and all the best and stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sunil. Uh, I really appreciate that you gave so many uh, practical uh, answers to some of the questions that I see on the left uh, hand side of my screen. Uh, I'd like, before I ask Mr. Ranganathan to speak, uh, I'd like to inform everyone that, you know, I see on my screen something popping up saying so and so has raised a hand or whatever. We're only going to take questions from the chat. Uh, and I've got the first one from 636. So I don't think we will be missing too many of those questions. So, with that, uh, Mr. Ranganathan, uh, can you please uh, address us? You're on mute. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Sanjay. Uh, thanks, uh, Ms. Rekha, members from LMA, uh, members of FIMA, secretary members of FIMA. It's indeed a uh, great pleasure to address you all through this Zoom call. We are facing a very tough time. I think this is unprecedented. We are fighting with an invisible enemy. <laughs> the world is going through a very, very tough time. Human race is very intelligent. We will overcome this. We will live and we will go through this stuff. But I think business will come back to normal. All things will flourish. But there are certain key things. This storm, we need to stand tall. We should not wither away. So there are certain things that we need to be cautious about. Uh, I share the kind of mindset, how things will be the way Mr. Mujal was talking about. This will last for a while. I also believe this will last for a while. But I also equally believe in some uh, magic. Some luck could happen the vaccine could come in the next three months' time. Normally, people say it's 12 to 18 months. Time. And also some other alternative tests. There is other one which, which is being talked about is that you, every individual will be tested for their immunity against uh, corona. If you have immunity, you go, go out and behave as usual. No issues. No mass, nothing required. That's one part of this thing. I feel something like that, if it comes, that miracle can happen. It can happen. So we believe that that kind of thing also keep the hope alive while 
currently the way it's going it is easily a long haul long long haul uh, but i think businesses need to be extremely careful we need, we have a lot of responsibility that's going to be and uh, the way things are going to happen is going to be very very different work from home as mr mindal was talking as sanjay was talking about it's going to be very different and i was also thinking i told my team members i am not going to come to office i may be coming okay so what's the point now it's far more productive compared to going and sitting in the office this is much better so that way we we are what we have realized in the last 3 weeks is that this is better productive than what we have been sitting together in office so therefore we are questioning ourselves need for a lot of offices across cities branches and so on what's the need absolutely no need we have to have some time we need to come and have to meet but very often to meet this kind of a thing every day going to all these things are not required of course factories are required no doubt on that so some of the imperative thing is i think cash is king now it's very important that we need to conserve cash and we should not be taking any rickety steps at this juncture and taking expansion at this juncture going about things will get normal in the next one month two months or three months time i think one should be playing it cautious if you delay some of the investments it is it's much better i also believe it is time to introduce uh topical services get into topical businesses and introduce topical products the world is going to be very different post covid once covid is behind and you can see this is what has happened when sars was first sars hit us at is uh, hit us at 2000 it was 2003 the health and hygiene products really skyrocketed at almost 20 to 30% growth rate and what followed that also if you look at immunity builders products which builds immunity that also started doing exceedingly well and you can expect at least now itself the awareness of hand sanitizers has gone up i can say the hand sanitizer was before corona that is in january it was only about not january i can say december it was about 800 crore market national and now we estimate it is somewhere around 40000 crores this may be the peak because of the corona demand everybody wants to use it but after that we believe it will be in excess of about 10000 crores maybe easily 10 to 20000 crores size so that i think it's it is becoming everyday part of life like that every kind of this thing the mass everything is skyrocketing it's going to be very different and we are going to behave very different many ways and all i can say is that the mindset required to fight the covid is very important we need to be uh, cautiously optimistic we need to be innovative at this juncture and uh, we need to conserve cash and all all very important things there are certain things that we need to take advantage of is the material prices will fall and we need to take advantage of that so that we we are able to um, pass on the benefit to the customers and one last thing i would like to say because a lot of questions are there and i think we need to fulfill our role as a citizen we all have our own sphere of influence as a company or as an association lma whatever be the case i think we need to it's time to stand shoulder to shoulder with government support the government no point in criticizing they are doing the best job i can i can tell you we don't know everybody is trying their best in terms of what to be done i think this is a time to support the government and advise everybody in our sphere of influence our own kind of people employees all people to maintain social distance all all the etiquette to be practiced to overcome the covid-19 with that i close my address and over to sanjay thank you uh, ranganathan uh, you also gave a lot of uh, you know the way we are working from home now uh, i think uh, i would i would like to go back <laughs> to the office every day uh, so uh, like i said before uh, we will uh, start taking questions questions that are coming from the chat mode i did say that the first question was at 636 but i noticed that uh, one of our past presidents uh, has asked a question a little later and i hope uh, none of you will mind if i start with that first and his question mr krishan kalra 
has asked this question of everyone, and I believe by that he means the three of us. Is the world likely to learn any permanent lessons from this tragic menace? I mean, by way of how we live and work, uh, like consumerism, our penchant, or rather obsession for luxury brands, and all good materialistic things of life. Is the work from home culture likely to set in for good? Will travel be reduced? Uh, will we start taking more holidays in India rather than going to popular and esoteric places outside? Uh, I, for one, uh, let me uh, uh, use my prerogative and answer this first. Uh, I think we are going to learn a lot of lessons from this menace. Uh, and I hope that we do not forget these lessons that we learn uh, very quickly. Uh, I, like I said, uh, be very reluctant or maybe less uh, not very happy to go to work uh, all the time. Um, I can work from home. I've realized that I can work from home. Uh, like uh, Mr. Ranganathan said and Mr. Munjal said, uh, why do we have such large offices? Why can't we just bring in people, give people assignments and bring them uh, when we need them or when the assignments are due? Uh, luxury brands. Uh, I've been uh, using the same set of clothes for the last, not the same, I mean, I've been washing them, but uh, the same similar clothes. Uh, I haven't worn a tie, a collar, with a, a shirt with a collar or uh, a jacket uh, for the last three and a half weeks. And uh, really, uh, the way we were uh, going around uh, with the good materialistic things of life, uh, I think that is going to change. Luckily, I, I believe that a lot of uh, us also realize that this way of life was not sustainable. And uh, whether we had young heroes like uh, Greta Thunberg or others who were pointing out to all of us that, you know, things need to change. We are making too many demands on our uh, the one earth that we have. Uh, I believe that uh, we will uh, realize that there is a better way to do things. Uh, as far as your question on travel is concerned, I really don't know how many airlines are going to survive this unless uh, they are given uh, huge support uh, by their different governments. Possibly as soon as uh, people are allowed uh, to gather, um, yeah, we will be able to take holidays. Uh, but I enjoy, I'm enjoying spending time with the family uh, being at home. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it might take a long time to take a holiday after this one uh, that I have had. Uh, Sunil, would you like to say anything? You did a pretty comprehensive job. So I don't know how many questions you have. If you have lots of questions, maybe only one of us can take it. Otherwise, if you like, I can, I can respond to it. Because I have a slight difference from what you said, by the way. Oh, OK. I, yeah, Go ahead. yeah. I, I, I believe human nature does not always change easily. When it, so we respond differently to different stimuli. This stimuli will change some of our habits permanently, but will certainly not change all our habits. We will spring back in many, many ways. We will travel again. We will go overseas. I don't think that that bit will change. It may change temporarily, maybe for a year, maybe even two years. But I don't think this will this will change permanently. And you are right. The difficulty will, will be with the airlines because there will be a long period in which they have no business. Um, uh, I think the things that we need to change as a nation are looking at strengthening something that we call, for example, the IDSP. This is the integrated disease surveillance uh, system that we had set up. It's a program which was set up in 2004, but it's just struggled along. We've never strengthened it. We never gathered enough data. We never funded it fully. We also have a health uh, information system that we set up in India in 2007. I think that will get strengthened. We will start putting resources behind public health, which we've not done in India. By the way, the monies that we spend on, on, on health, 80% goes to treatments. Only 7% goes to preventive care. It's completely distorted. So to the point that Mr. Kalra is, is, is uh, making, I think we have to take a step back and think of how we approach life in, in some ways. That bit, I think, will change permanently. Maybe we should even also look at whether we want to or should we be spending so much on arms and defense? Should we not be sending that on, on quality of life for individuals and public spaces? So 
uh, I, I don't believe everything will change, but I do believe some will change permanently. Okay. Uh, so let me, I, I wasn't expecting to talk about uh, Let me give you the next uh, question as well, which was the first question that uh, came up, because I believe you're far more capable to answer this one. Where do we get, this is from Dr. Vikasi, uh, he says, where do we get the trade off between social and economic challenge? Can't, can't hear you, Sanjay. Uh, where do we get the trade off between socio and economic challenges? Okay, let me try and guess. I, I only heard part of what you're saying. So I think we're talking of the balance between lives and livelihoods. Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, it's clear that the initial period, our focus has to be more on preserving life. Because currently the value chain, by the way, is already broken. It's partially broken because of the lockdowns. It's also partially broken because of China. So the moment we are able to secure lives enough, our attempt to bring livelihoods back has got to get full attention. Even now, as you may be aware, between the 11 uh, uh, special groups that the uh, government has made, the prime minister's office, the ministries, the CII, FIKI, ASOCHEM, there are lots of initiatives going on, on on creating a plan for how do we get back to normal. And it has to be a, a phased plan, and that's the only way to do it. We, we cannot just turn the button and try and bring everything back. So this balance will have to be struck easily over the next three to six months. It's not going to be weeks. It will have to be three to six months before we can actually bring economic activity to anywhere near uh, back to where it was. And as I said, the recovery of the loss will, I think, take a, a year and a half uh, from what we will lose as productive time and, and value uh, on this time of shutdown. And this is assuming that this shutdown is only the period that we imagine right now, which is only the next few months. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ranganathan, I'll give you the next question. Should Wuhan uh, be taken as an example or an exception? This is from Sony Goel uh, in Batinda. Wuhan, I think we should uh, see the way they have contained the kind of this thing, Corona. I think we should take it as an example. Routed there, I think eventually they controlled it. But still, I think the last two days, if you see 150 cases have started coming back again. And that's a concern. We thought uh, China with their military discipline kind of, they would be able to control it much better. But uh, this one thing that's 100 numbers, hopefully they control it much better. But I think we need to draw a lot of lessons the way they controlled it. But they went on for a lockout for 76 days. This is not a kind of this thing, not just 21 days or 40 days or what we are kind of thing. But if you have to follow Wuhan model, I think we have to open it only on June 11th. So that's the kind of it's a long haul we need to be staying indoor. So that I think we need to wait and see how things are panning out. I I am fully in uh, agreement with uh, what uh, Mr. Mundal said that there is the balance between life and livelihoods. We need to ensure that that is also going. What's the point in when there is existence itself is challenged? What's the point in escaping from Corona? I think it's very important. People are fed. Thank you. Just, just one, one uh, add, add to what Ranga is saying, uh, Sanjay. Uh, the difference between Wuhan and us is we are catching uh, this at a much earlier stage. Our lockdown is at a much, much earlier stage than it was in Wuhan. They already had a full community spread before they actually started the lockdown. So these are very different. It's not a like-to-like -like comparison. So it's actually hard to imagine because there is not enough information about this virus that's out there. There is speculation about whether it will die out in the heat. We just don't know enough right now. Uh, there, are, there are mutations already being, being formed. There are three or four mutations that have already been seen in different labs. So plasma treatments have been started right now. So there is a lot to learn from them because of the amount of information and data they gathered, by the way. That, of course, is, is, is amazing. So that can be helpful and useful to the entire world. But we need to get on with the process of also in parallel doing all of the research initiatives at this moment as we address, try and address the treatment and the prevention. Yeah, I think the other thing to remember is that uh, China is a dictatorship while we are not. 
that being said, I think uh, there has been a tremendous amount of discipline uh, in our country uh, to ensure that you know these incidents you know, expand. Uh, the next question uh, is from Mr. Ajay Verma, EC uh, member, Nepal manager for the country. Post COVID, government would of course provide subsidies to all sizes of industries. How do we ensure product quality in that scenario? Uh, the uh, you know I'll I'll try and answer this question uh, because we have a uh, um, few factories uh, that we uh, that are also shut down. Uh, we are trying to see in, uh, you know, whenever we uh, we uh, ensure that uh, we Sanjay, your voice Sanjay, your voice is not very clear. Can you get a bit closer to the mic? Okay, and maybe Ranga, right? Ranga and I will put ourselves on mute, so so there's no feedback at all. Is that better? Okay, uh, so what we are trying to do is ensure that uh, basically when we op reopen, uh, we op run only those machines that are needed. We don't open the whole factory totally. Uh, we only open where there is demand, and uh, we bring in the right number of people. We turn on only those machines because currently the I think, like Sunil mentioned, the first thing to do is conserve cash. Uh, the second thing to do is uh, cut costs. So we will have to open in a way that uh, we are, even if we are operating at lower capacity utilization, our costs are under control. There is no other way uh, to restart. Uh, we ensure productivity by making sure that we bring in the right people, uh, to do the work uh, that they are supposed to do. Quality, of course, uh, has to be ensured. One of the things uh, that we have started doing is we're looking, you know, when you're running an organization, there's so many things that are important, but not urgent. And some of these things really improve your processes, your procedures. So that's one of the things that we've been doing uh, through this uh, lockdown period to ensure that whenever we restart, we operate in a much more efficient way. So, uh, Sunil, would you like to add to that? Or uh, Mr. Ranganathan, would you like to add? Sure. So, uh, the, the guidelines for restarting, by the way, have already been drafted. So, the guidelines actually say that when you start an operation, it must not go up over more than 25% of what was your normal. And you have to attempt to bring only the minimum number of people in. You also have to make arrangement to have them stay on site or very close to your place of work because everybody may not be able to accommodate the people inside. And then even inside, they have to maintain all of the distance, etc., the hygiene, the sanitization, all of those standards have to be met. Uh, the challenge we're going to have is since the entire value chain has to start. So even if your factory was to start, Sanjay, yeah. you have hundreds of suppliers right. and you have suppliers, suppliers, and you have suppliers, suppliers, suppliers. All of them have to be able to start together only then you are going to be able to produce and True. you will only produce if you can sell. So right. if your logistics, distribution and sales and after sales are also working is the only way you will be able to operate. So it's, it's much more complex than just a simple statement of restarting. So we have to do this very thoughtfully, very sensibly. And I have to say the guidelines that have been drafted are very, very good. In fact, I think uh, the retail sector will have to be, uh, retail side will have to be open first so that the demand, you know, you can see that there is a demand as it grows. Otherwise, until then, it really doesn't make sense to open your factories uh, if there is no demand. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I will go to uh, the next one, um, which is uh, from Mr. Uh, Paresh Rathod from the Navsari Management Association. Uh, he would like to know what would be the GDP of India post COVID, since we understand that countries like Thailand are experiencing negative 5%, while the African uh, continent is around negative 4%. Mr. Ranganathan, would you like to answer that? Sir, uh, my, my point is that this is going to be tough. This is going to be definitely, as Mr. Munjal said, this is going to be and um, maybe we should be lucky if we are in plus zone, uh, is what I would say. It all depends on how long the COVID prolongs. If this is going to prolong for six to nine months time, 
on and off shutting and kind of thing disrupting the economy i think we had it so my view point is whatever we have done it uh, itself is this thing we should be lucky if we are in a uh, positive zone my my hunch is that we will get into negative zone okay uh, there is a question uh, from uh, mr ganesh natrajan to everyone uh, but then he says for mr sunil munjal uh, don't we need to address the very real issue that manufacturing industry has to get its factory and supply and demand chain operations running to re-engage daily paid and migrant workers. IT can adjust to a new narrative, but we must make the wheels of manufacturing turn again. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more, absolutely. And, and I, in some sense, I just answered this uh, question that unless the entire value chain is working, this will not work. And uh, I have also made a suggestion, uh, Sanjay, that let's not try and bring all the migrants back from the villages traipsing all across the country, because that raises the risk. There are many who could not go back home. They are right now in shelters set up by the governments or otherwise. Let's use the people who are already in and around the, the places of work. There are people in Punjab who can be used for agriculture. There are people in Delhi who can be used for factories in Noida and Gurgaon. So uh, I think that would have to be in the first stage. And then the next stage, that, and you cannot do without those people. That's another thing. India is suddenly waking up to the fact that the number of people in the informal sector, you know, some of us have talked about this for the last 15 years, but I think the realization seems to have hit home only now that 90 plus percent of India is the informal worker. It's informal labor. And they actually turn the wheels of the entire economy of this country. It's like we do in the small scale. The largest amount of employment, manufacturing, and export takes place in the small scale. But you cannot do it at the large scale because they will provide the design, the logistics, the branding, the distribution, uh, the innovation. That, so, so it has to be a symbiotic relationship that we realize which provides a full value to India. So each sector of the country needs to be valued and understood for its value that it provides. The risk, however, is I see a real risk that people will now try and, and run this with a new cost base. And the first thing that we get hurt is employment, because people will try and shrink their companies post COVID when they have to go back into operation. That is going to happen for sure, uh, because companies would have suffered. The NBFCs who are supporting them would have suffered. The banks would have supporting them would have suffered. So everyone will try and squeeze this because as we are saying, cash is king, but cash will not be available forever if you have no revenues and costs of operational costs running. So it is going to be a tough period. We have to be prepared to face this tough period, uh, both with, uh, uh, with a sensible approach and with some, some guts. Thank you. I think you've answered the next question that's also there from uh, Kavita Rajesh, who is the treasurer of the HMA in Hyderabad. Uh, because she has asked, what is the message for SME post lockdown? Some guidelines to keep them going with a positive note. Uh, SMEs are the are the backbone, and uh, like you just mentioned, you know, once the retail cycle starts, so that it's only then that uh, most of us are going to have uh, the ability to start our factory, which in turn is going to give uh, benefit to the SME uh, in the form of orders and uh, being able to supply to us. So I think everyone has to be has to remain positive, and uh, you know, uh, wait for this uh, lockdown. Follow all the disciplines because the longer uh, this um, pandemic can only last as long as uh, this you know, number of uh, the rate of infection keeps going up. Once we see a positive sign, uh, the rates of infection and the rates of deaths are reducing. It's only then that we can start uh, looking forward to what is going to happen after this. Uh, but, Chayas, yeah. But, but by the way, there is a big opportunity as well. We must realize that many large companies across the world have now created what they call a one plus one strategy. Those who are entirely dependent on China as their sole source for many components, many products, and even some services, are now saying, while I may not completely get out of China, but I cannot only depend on China as a single source. So I will, some of it for political reasons, some for business reasons, some as, as a strategy for uh, any black swan event. 
are saying, I will go to another country. Uh, in the last year and a half, with the trade war going on with the US, this opportunity was there. So countries who benefited were countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, a little bit Malaysia, even Bangladesh. We did not actually wake up to this fact earlier. We only started working work on this about four months ago. I hope that now, as India, we will collectively, specifically go and visit each of these companies and make a pitch to bring them to India. Japan has announced the largest relief package in the world of any country. And within that relief package is a pocket that they've offered to Japanese companies who are in China to go and build capacity in another country other than China as well. Now, other countries are, are doing the same. In some places, it's only funded by the private enterprise. In some, the governments are supporting them. But it's a huge opportunity for India to attract both investment and capability in products and services that we don't currently do. Uh, Sunil, you are very popular. Uh, there is someone who has asked, can you please share the uh, five R you mentioned uh, some time ago? With, uh, greater, with some brief on each of them, a little longer. Uh, we've lost you, Sunil. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. So I was talking about the resolve we've shown as a country. I was showing, uh, talking about the resilience we have shown that we need now to demonstrate as we move forward. I was also talking about the need for us to return to, to life that allows companies, home, individuals, families to function in, in some form of normalcy. Uh, I was also talking about reimagination. So this needs us to reimagine what the new normal would be. The new normal would certainly not go back to what the earlier, question, uh, earlier situation was. To the question that Mr. Kalra asked earlier, how many things will remain the same and how many will change? I certainly expect things will change. So what is the new normal, I think, is, is something which will be useful for each one of us to apply our minds to do. And the last one is the reform which should be in our new systems, in our new tastes, in our new consumption, in our new processes, in our new communications. So these are the, the, the five R's I was talking about. <laughs> uh, next question for you, uh, Raghunathan. Uh, how this is from Mr. Ripal Patel. Uh, he's an executive council member the Rajkot Management Association. How can we turn the situation into advantage in the coming months? As there is a tough trust deficit with China, which can be a huge advantage to India, how can we, we be ready after? You, you, I lost you somewhere, but what I understand, how, how are you going to be better and take advantage of the situation uh, is what yeah. I... Okay. Right. I think uh, the, it is all about, it's a mind game. My viewpoint is if you are completely, that is what I, cautiously optimistic, time to innovate, all these things are very important. And it is the, the species which survive is not the most intelligent, but the most adaptive one. I think we need to adapt to this situation and quickly look at what else I can do. Then, okay, I will wait for the sun to rise. I'll wait for the COVID to go off. If it prolongs, you are finished. So the key point is that how we adapt and move on is very important. The fundamentals of we taking advantage of the whole thing, the emergence post-COVID is only going to be how we are going to adapt ourselves, how we are going to innovate. I think this is very, very fundamental how we can take advantage of. So otherwise, I think if we are going to keep quiet and wait for the kind of thing, things to be normal, I, I don't think that uh, it, may, it may become normal. I don't think you need to have a long haul. You need to have a big cash pile to hold on to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All you require is to a quick adaptability would be would be the name of the game, is my view. and that's how we can take advantage of this. Yeah, he he had said that uh, also that as there is a trust deficit with China, I think uh, you know over the last few years and maybe even more so after the, in the last few months. Uh, China is believed to be a little less trustworthy. Uh, I think all, all through, uh, India has uh, not only uh, been a good place for investing as far as uh, the Western countries and Japan has, uh, have been concerned, uh, because all of them have very successful joint ventures over here. 
I think uh, the Make in India initiative uh, that uh, Sunil mentioned uh, some time ago, answering another question. Uh, yes, we do need to go out uh, whenever we are allowed to go out and make the case for India. I'm sure, uh, as he said, the government is also uh, taking uh, into account all that uh, turn people off from India and will make our country more attractive uh, to foreign investment as we go forward. Uh, do you want to add anything, Sunil? Otherwise, I'll take the next question. Yeah, yeah, please take the next question. Yeah, so the next question is from Ketan um, Kothari. Uh, he wants to know whether we he can prepare a list of ideas and submit to the government of India for action uh, post lockdown. Now, uh, IMA, as far as I'm aware, is a non-lobbying group. Uh, but maybe uh, if you do send uh, such a list, uh, you could send it to Rekha. We can see then what to do. Is that okay, Rekha? You're on mute. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Uh, now, this, uh, the next question is from Mr. M. P. Tyagi, and I don't think I'm very uh, qualified to answer this question. Uh, he's from MMA. He wants to know how the uh, stock market will behave after the lockdown 2.0 is over. Uh, I can't answer this question. Uh, Sunil, maybe you can. Well, this is a $6 billion question, by the way. Any, anybody who can should every, advise everybody else. But, but two things are for sure. Uh, the distinction I was talking about earlier in different businesses is the kind of work that almost all stock analysts are doing right now. They're trying to figure out the impact, the, both the short-term impact and the long-term slash permanent impact on different industry verticals and therefore on different companies of the current situation and how it, it, it resolves itself into normalcy. So there are companies like airlines, um, financial services, movie theaters. They've all taken a beating right now. Their stocks are down, way down. So if you believe that these are sectors which will spring back, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, opportunity to invest. And by the way, if someone is investing, please, it, it's not an art or a science. It's a combination of art and science. Please don't try and perfect to get the bottom of the of the trough, because that's the toughest thing to get in any any investment. At this moment, this, the the prices are low enough for one to start to invest and invest over a period of time, because they're not going to rise in the next two or three months. But the expectation, of course, is that over a period of time, and this is not six months or a year, by the way. I'm talking about a longer period of time. Uh, these will uh, go back to uh, where the markets have been, but the key players. The big winners may not be the same ones who are out there today. And that's where uh, both the expertise and the luck comes in. OK. Uh, I believe uh, our senior vice president, Mr. Uh, Harshpati Singhania, is also on um, online. So I thought that I would uh, uh, ask him uh, to answer the next question. Um, and the question is, um, one moment, I've lost the <laughs> track of questions. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you suggest to MSMEs for their finances, which are always stretched out and government never helps them by way of any financial impetus, impetus or relief like taxes? How do you think MSMEs are going to survive? Mr. President, uh, thank you very much uh, for putting me perhaps one of the most difficult questions here. But uh, let me try and see. See, MSMEs are um, a, a, a complete part of the entire value chain. And I think MSMEs are the ones which are going to face some of the most amount of difficulty or are already are facing a great amount of difficulty. So MSME, frankly speaking, is not just MSME. The government will have to come out with a major package to help support industry through this. Uh, the, the, the issue is that after the initial announcement that was made by Reserve Bank of India about some degree of um, three months of um, you know, 
allowing a moratorium on interest and um, repayments of uh, principal and interest and so on and so forth and some EMIs. We are still awaiting a major uh, input to come in. Uh, what our understanding is, is that the government is very actively working on, uh, on a financial relief uh, package. Uh, my personal belief, and this is entirely my personal belief, that uh, given the various constraints, a lot of it would perhaps be directed towards the MSMEs. So therefore, we'll have to see what the government uh, considers to be some kind of relief. I am personally confident, however, that uh, MSMEs are going to be in a major consideration set because they are in you know, millions in numbers uh, and uh, they employ collectively a very large number of people and it is a matter of survival. Uh, uh, and you know, we don't know how many businesses will get permanently affected. Uh, just um, today I can share with you, we, I had a Zoom call uh, with Vicky with uh, a couple of ministers and also with the chairman of the State Bank of India. And uh, one of the points that was being made to him is that, you know, whichever way it is, we cannot allow any business to really die or any account to become an MPA. So really speaking, that will be the, uh, to a great extent dependent on that. But having said that, I think, you know, any MSME like any other business would uh, have to uh, review their financial position very stringently, take various measures. Globally, I was on a con call recently with, um, with, with an international group. And for example, okay, that's not MSME, but they said that they are targeting up to 50% reduction in uh, fixed costs and overheads in their units. So one will have to be very aggressive, very uh, ruthless in terms of, uh, we, we'll have to really do a zero-based budgeting. We'll have to start looking at our organization design on a, on a clean slate. Uh, and uh, so various things will have to be done uh, to, uh, to, to survive, simply to survive. Thank you. Uh, sorry to uh, throw one of the hardest questions at you. I'll give you one of the simplest ones uh, while you are on. Uh, it's from MMA, uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar. He says, maybe working from home is not accepted by young executives. Is it's not a glamorous, uh, it's not very glamorous. And the other problem he has is he says all the young wives uh, think husbands are idle. Okay. Have to make. So on, on, on the chat, uh, Mr. Ashok, there was an answer already given uh, to one of your questions, the second part, where uh, the answer said that, you know, many young wives are also working. So, uh, you know, it's not, it's not that. No, I seriously, I don't think work from home is not glamorous for young people. Uh, is it something that you can... Uh, do all the time uh, depends on the nature of your job, frankly. Uh, and uh, there are in Western countries um, several jobs which are essentially work from home because they are more in the nature of um, consulting and reports and being able to get back and they are on flexi time. So it is possible. Yes, you have to create uh, a, a sort of a small environment within your home within which you are comfortable. Uh, you have to follow discipline guidelines. So it can't be, you know, you're sitting on, <clears throat> on your bed and um, looking at the computer and doing that. It has to be properly done. For example, our company has issued guidelines to work on people to work from home, which includes that you will be decently attired. You will have a separate workspace within your home. Uh, you will have regular hours. And you also have uh, apps nowadays which monitor uh, times and which you which the employer which the main company can can see whether you are really working uh, or you are uh, not really working so it can be done and there are several people who uh, who believe that uh, you know I mean they still want to get back to office and maybe in some cases frankly there will be a little bit of a, a hybrid thing uh, I would argue that for younger people who work from home may actually not be so difficult as it for as it is for some of the older people like us because they in any case are working all the time uh, off their computers i find for example to personalize it my my children they are all the time on the computer uh, and i'm not talking about playing games 
but they consume their news electronically they work electronically uh, either on the computer or through their uh, smart devices so for for such people work from home uh, may not be difficult thank you uh, sunil i know you are want to leave in a little short in a short while one last question for you uh, he says uh, this is from jibu paul a uh, question to mr munjal we will have huge cash shortage our receivables will not come on time into brackets uh, some of which we may never get at all our liabilities including payables will be very high and killing our market would have and killing our market would have evaporated uh, what are the possibilities growth possibilities with this new normal he is president uh, kma um this is a very very useful question uh, this is a question we all have to ask ourselves as companies and businesses because this is going to impact almost all companies across the country except those as said who's who have benefited from the current uh, situation uh, so the suggestion that we have been making to the government is first that they have to support and to the earlier point that harsh was making there will be some support for small and mid sized enterprises for sure ideally like in all countries it should be for all business because all business will get impacted in fact the larger companies will get impacted more because their ability to compress costs is lower uh, at this moment so one of the suggestions we have been giving to everybody again is a point that uh, harsh had made in the old days we used to say there is some fixed cost and there is some variable cost now we are saying forget the concept of fixed cost we will not accept the con- old concept the fixed cost also has to be compressible you have to find parts of the fixed cost which are variable and you also have to figure out those which are deferrable so that you are able to build your businesses back from a lower cost base than you would otherwise have had second is this is this will need true enterprise it's like we when we set started our businesses in some sense all of us will have to bring back some of that same entrepreneurial energy to the fore to say this is what my business needs now to take off uh the demand initially obviously is going to be low but that's not a permanent situation and those who are smarter uh quicker and more enterprising will will benefit quicker but eventually uh things will get back to normal but as we are all saying it will be a new normal where some businesses would have lost out permanently uh, some would spring back to where they were and some will benefit so you have to figure out for your business and i can't answer for for your business i don't know enough about your business is how in my business do i position myself to benefit more than rather than to lose when things turn around thank you thank you sunil uh, so next, yeah so go go ahead i'll i'll if you, i'll take one more then i'll drop off after that okay i was going to ask mr ranganathan the next question also on msmes but you can add please, to please, mr ranganathan please go ahead no no please ask him so, uh, mr ranganathan there are quite a few questions on msmes so i will put them to you uh, what is the fate of msmes people with minimal resources if they would have shut down longer without any income and have to pay their workforce uh, pay for electricity bank interest uh, etc he all someone else mr lakhani also wants to know uh, what are the advantages uh and disadvantages for msme sector post uh covid uh, 2019 uh so if you could take these two questions uh, yeah and what are the possibilities for indian industries how can we see the current situation opti- optimistically i think in this kind of a scenario uh, msmes will be the worst hit because they have very limited cash resource and when business is very less Uh, they'll be they'll be the kind of thing busted but having said that i think they are also quite adaptable they will they are far more adaptable they'll quickly adapt themselves is also very important they may it, you may look like msme is lot of msmes have died and when the situation becomes normal and when there are opportunities lot of msmes will stop again so that way i i would say that it is it is going to be a very tough time and when the demand is lesser when less number of shops are open the country if you look at country is having about 10 million outlets retail we are talking of even with the suraksha kind of the thing it is about 2 million outlets are going to be open not many more 
and currently only 5% of the outlets are open not even 5 i would say 2 3% of the outlets are open so when the outlets more outlets are not open therefore it has a bearing on overall consumption when i am sitting at home it has a bearing on my own the consumption of the consumers that will have a complete cyclical effect in the supply chain in the whole industry across and i i feel that uh, this is a very very tough time to go through is what i would say but i am optimistic they are the opportunity they are the 80% job providers and therefore jobs will get lot of jobs will be under pressure and same way i think when there are opportunities when the economy swings back you can see a lot of msmes from they come from nowhere suddenly with rain lot of new crops coming in kind of this thing the msmes will have have the power to come back as well thank you uh, sunil do you want to add to anything add to this uh, only i think uh, what this will also do i have already spoke about entrepreneurship this will also give room for innovation those who are able to innovate more innovate quickly and innovate to produce goods and services which can get to customers easier which can be more which meet uh, meet the felt need and be available at a price which gives them an advantage will clearly have a, a longer runway available to them for growth so it's not all negative by the way in, in like in any crisis it, it's a crisis is also an opportunity so this will demonstrate to us the indian innovation entrepreneurship as we turn this ship around thank you uh the next question is uh, from mr ajay and kavun i don't i don't have the full name uh the only thing that we are sure about is the uncertainty how far will this last which segments will be affected and the shape of things to come what is your view on going for deficit monetization to support the common man with in kind transfers of food items community kitchens healthcare along with in cash transfers would you like to answer that sunil sure i can so i have a very clear view on this by the way i think for some time we have to stop focusing on fiscal deficit as a measure that we have kept for ourselves it is important by the way that don't don't I, i misunderstand what i'm saying but in the current situation it means nothing we have to print more money we have to use it productively because our, our global rating is triple b right now you don't want global ra uh, uh, rating agencies bringing the next lower uh, rating is junk so you don't want to be junk but if you demonstrate that any additional money that you print is going to be used for productive assets or only to fight the corona virus pandemic no rating agency will downgrade you the second thing which is important is for us to use our reserves that we have currently including in reserve bank we have a massive foreign exchange reserves we can easily set aside 20 or 30 billion as a, a backup plan and we have rupee reserves which can be used given to the government to spend because that's what you use these reserves for we have food grain reserve which we are now saying give that food free of cost to the poor this is what it's meant for this is the kind of crisis that no country ever gets into and if you are going to hold on to them now when is it for so we need to do both things absolutely we need to get cash into people's hands directly and that's the most important thing right now because the difficulty is going to be as as i think ranga said and you also said earlier that cash will be the most critical thing at this moment and that becomes a role of the government to support those who cannot support themselves uh, i completely agree uh, agree with this but this has to be done in a very smart very intelligent and a very calibrated manner at this moment we have given the lowest support package in the entire world by the way it's not even 1% while we have said it's 170000 crores but actually part of it is what was there already in the in the budget it's just being brought forward we must also forget that we wrote a budget we have to write a new budget we have to take money away from some other resources and put it into this there are countries like japan which have gone well over 12% they are now talking of 20% of their economy uh, as as a support Uh, us is already over 10% we are at 1% and that too not completely so clearly there is some more work to be done on that front uh, to provide the support that all of india needs industry citizens homes the elderly the disadvantaged and some of it will come as cash and some of it must come as kind because cash may get abused by in some places or may not reach some places efficiently you know uh, thank you and 
Yeah. And I'm going to drop off now if you don't mind. No problem. Thanks. So thank you. What I also heard is that uh, Germany is spending close to 12% uh, of its GDP on support programs. And I think it's against their constitution. But they have also just gone ahead. Correct. I mean, most conservative no, many, in the world. You're, uh, you're right. Um, sorry, you're right, Sanjay. Many countries have actually amended the constitution only to address this because they're saying this is a crisis. This is like a war-like situation. Yeah. This is and a famine-like situation. The other thing that we have seen is that uh, you know, in Britain, uh, if you get if you have a job in a company, and I believe that's any size of company, uh, if you get paid uh, less than thirty thousand pounds per year as salary. Uh, government is allowing uh, these companies to furlough workers and they are picking up 80% of the salary. Almost yeah. similar in uh, the uh, Netherlands, where uh, also they are picking up a large percentage, maybe close to 85% of the salary of people, obviously below a certain uh, salary level. But they are ensuring that uh, people who are, uh, who are having problems uh, will get uh, money coming in from the government even if uh, they can't coming in. And, and they're doing this for every size of uh, business, Sanjay, not only for small businesses, they're doing it for all businesses, but for the low paid uh, uh, jobs. So okay. thank you all very much. Um, you. This is a wonderful initiative by Aima. Uh, I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm going to log off. Bye bye. Uh, the next question is uh, from Mr. Singanya. Uh, specifically uh, from Sunil Goel, Secretary MMA. Uh, we are in chemical trading to paper industry. So what f is the future you foresee for the paper industry post COVID? Uh, Mr. Singanya, are you on? I think okay. we have. Yes, yeah. I'm unmuted now. Well, I mean, we can, we can discuss the paper industry separately, but I think, uh, uh, in, in simple terms, um, I think there are both opportunities and challenges. Uh, to some extent, perhaps, on the paper industry will be uh, the, the higher level of digitization and everybody using this may have, uh, you know, may have an impact. On the other hand, there is an opportunity in terms of much greater packaging, a whole lot of education uh, demand, which will be coming up right away because uh, sessions have been disrupted. Uh, a lot of hygiene um, product, um, you know, used papers, etc., etc. People will use and dispose and throw away. So it, it's a it's a mixed bag. Uh, and like any other industry, there will be low commodity prices and so on. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, is um, one moment. Um, <laughs> Uh, with respect to fixed cost in the ongoing and upcoming cash and the upcoming cash flow crunch, how to boost employee morale? Is there any non-cash consideration which could be offered for employees for MSME, especially non-company in the form of organizations? This is from CA Nitin of Palghat uh, Management Association. Mr. Ranganathan? So the cash crunch, I think it's, it, the only way out is that you can convert, like what Ms. Munjal was talking about, some of the components can be converted into variable one as the business comes, is the only thing. Motivation, if the company has money, you can you can motivate them by paying the full time. I think that's the best form at this juncture. And if the company can't afford, if it is a very small company, I think the company need to look at its own means of retaining and motivating them. Uh, I think that that is the kind of uh, thing is what I would say. Giving them some kind of a thing. Some company, I was told, some company has taken a call below 15,000. This is a small company. Below 15,000 pay, payment people. It said it will, I will pay full. Above 15,000, I will cut pro rata. The percentage is depends on the cadre of the managers kind of thing. I think that still, I think they have very, very kind of thing in terms of taking care of the people who are downtrodden and said they require minimum this kind of salary for their existence to take care of their families. Somewhere I think the companies need to look at protecting their own employees because anything great can be achieved only with employees. If employees are not that stand alone with one proprietor or kind of this thing, nothing great can be done. 
I think it's the team efforts. Anything that's produced is a great team efforts. I think it's important that they are taken care of. I, I agree with you totally. You know, this is the time we all say that employees are our uh, greatest assets. And uh, this is the time to put our money where our mouth is. Uh, number one. Number two, I believe that we should uh, be in touch with them like almost every day. It should not be all work. We should inquire with their, uh, about their families, about uh, what situation they are in. And whenever possible, whatever good news we get, uh, we have to uh, pass on to them. Uh, and this is all kinds of employees, not just uh, people who work under you or your subordinates, but right down uh, to the last level in, in the company. Uh, the next question is uh, about revival of the banking sector uh, post COVID uh, post COVID nineteen era. Uh, I think this is a a question that uh, possibly government of India will have to uh, answer because as it is, the banking sector was uh, there were quite a few issues uh, with some of the private sector banks. Uh, there were uh, other issues with. Uh, uh, public sector banks as well, uh, the mergers and demergers. RBI, I believe, will have to tread a very careful path uh, through this crisis and uh, support the banks wherever needed. Uh, Mr. Ranganathan or uh, Mr. Singhania, if you'd like to add to this. This is a tough time. If you ask me, the bankers, one end, uh, the 90 days NPA kind of norm, are all getting relaxed. The other end, the RBI and the government wants banks to lend more and support them. Suddenly, banks have been taught in the last two, three years to be very strict and against go against security. If they lend loan, if the NPAs are all held against them. Now, the country wants them to support, they take risks. I think this is very, very difficult. Very difficult for banks to adapt into this kind of thing. And they would go and look at for big lenders where they can they think their loans are secure, then going and lending to a lot of small and medium enterprise and where the loan risk is much, much higher. And that is where unless government comes back very clearly and says that I will underwrite these things, that's going to be a lot of a problem. On the bank reforms, if you look at I, the, the path we have traded, I think this we are going to change track now. We are going to be liberal. After the COVID, I think we need to come back to the original reform, uh, this thing, the way the strictness and tightness, they kind of sing uh, against the creditors who don't pay, who defaulted. I think they, that must continue to happen, is my viewpoint. Okay. Uh, I, 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 uh, what what uh, CK said was right. The only thing I can again say is that. You know, the only impression I got again from this morning's uh, discussion with the SBI chairman was that I think banks are trying, at least the larger public sector banks are trying um, to see how best issues can be alleviated because they know it's an extraordinary situation. But uh, as, uh, as uh, you know, Ranga alluded that at the end of the day, the backstop will have to be the Reserve Bank of India. And banks at the best are intermediaries. I mean, uh, and, and the entire financial system has to remain healthy. So essentially, RBI will have to provide certain backstop, you know, like uh, guaranteeing, um, giving certain guarantees to banks, et cetera, et cetera, to say, or recapitalizing part of them, um, doing the kinds of things that Sunil also talked about, uh, monetizing some reserves, uh, and doing those kinds of things uh, which will come in. One of the issues that I had suggested in the meeting, for example, was that, look, uh, maybe on credit rating and uh, NPAs, there should be a standstill and we say for about six months or one year, uh, there will be no downgrades in rating because this is an extraordinary situation uh, where, uh, you know, financial covenants uh, will be looked at differently. And the banks did say that they are willing to look at, um, you know, providing working capital with different, with lower margins, allowing companies uh, to have higher inventories or debtors because they know what is, this is the reality. So I think uh, there will be some accommodation on the end of banks, but for bigger measures where banks get into financial difficulty, the Reserve Bank will have to come uh, and, and help them out. I think like it happened in 2008 in, um, uh, in, in, in the US uh, where TARP came in and literally 
the government uh, came in and pr provided, took stakes in banks uh, and, and provided them the funds. Uh, maybe something of that nature will help you. For. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I guess uh, we are coming to the end of the session. Uh, we had planned it from uh, 6.30 uh, to uh, about 8 o'clock. Uh, and we are almost at 8 o'clock. So uh, any last uh, comments, uh, Mr. Ranganathan? I think thanks, uh, Sanjay. I thoroughly enjoyed the Q&A session. I also learned a lot. Uh, I think it's nice to hear you and Mr. Munjal also. I think the perspective definitely gets enriched. Uh, it's very nice. I think very uh, involved audience and I think very incisive questions is what I can say. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, What I would, uh, I would, I would really uh, agree. Couldn't agree with you uh, more. Uh, there is a lot to learn, and some of the questions that have been asked, and they've come literally from all across the country, uh, are really incisive. Uh, they make you think, and uh, having you and uh, Sunil uh, really helped. Uh, wherever <laughs> I was at a loss for words. So thank you very much uh, for what, uh, for your contributions uh, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, I'd really like to thank Aima and uh, Rekha and her team for organizing this. And I'd like to mention that uh, this is something that we will continue to do. So the next CEO speak uh, will be on the 21st of uh, April. Uh, at the same time, uh, that's next Tuesday at 6.30, between 6.30 and 8. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, Mr. Singhania, our senior vice president, uh, with our past president, Mr. Mohandas Pai. And all of you know that he, is, uh, he will have a lot to say. Uh, so the three of us, because I'll be moderating it, uh, will be there uh, next week. So uh, with that, uh, we will end this session. Uh, the session has been uh, recorded, by the way, and uh, will be made available on IMA YouTube or on the IMA website. So with that, uh, I believe, uh, Rekha, uh, I, I guess I can end the session for this evening. Uh, Mr. President, if you allow me half a minute, there's some yes, information. <laughs> uh, I understand that there is a 24 by 7 control room being run by government in at least Department of DPIIT, Department of Industries, in Commerce, also, in Railways also, and also in West India is sort of running 24 by 7. The idea here is that if there are genuine issues with regard to, you know, industry and commerce and export and a whole lot of issues uh, on transport and movement, they can be sort of reached and uh, companies can tell them that these are the kinds of hardships they are facing and they will try their best to to address that. And uh, yeah, so I mean, that, that I thought I'd share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks, Sanjay. Thanks, Rekha. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. See you next week. Thank you for yes. joining.